We're looking at verses 25, 26 on this Father's Day. It says that Adam had relations with his wife again, by that referring to sexual, and she gave birth to a son named him Seth. Because he said, this is what his name means, God has anointed, appointed, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel for Cain killed him. What Abel, what this word Seth actually means is the appointed one. The appointed one. To Seth, and I find this interesting as well. Notice what he says in verse 26. He says, to Seth, to him also a son was born. So in two verses, we've gone from a son to a grandson. And he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so we're going to talk about this today as a Father Day message to bring hope to your life, to bring some kind of resolution maybe in your life. Hmm. Maybe things haven't been going well for you. You look back behind your, your walk, your life, maybe the last 10 years, you evaluate it, and you go like, ooh, that was uh, too good. A lot of challenges. Maybe some of that stuff is still present in your life. It's, it, then it's called baggage. <laughs> baggage. That's what people call baggage. Well, I have good news for you today. God brought you this way. Brought you this way to show you how to clean it up. How to, how to get rid of it. How to bring some resolution in your life to the mistakes you've made. I'll tell you one thing about God that people miss a great deal in their walk with him is how forgiving he is. How forgiving God is. He is a magnificent, forgiving father. No matter how, fa how your fathers have treated you in this life, you have one that should have set the model for the rest of us. And that is your heavenly father. His character never changes by the wind or what's going on. Like maybe our fathers or maybe we as a father. But I'm telling you, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and you can always bank on that. His character is never going to waver. It's not based on your character. His character is not reflexive on your character in that he watches your character and adjusts his life to it. That's not a, you look at his care and adjust your life to it. You pay, cl pay close attention today because God brought you our way to teach you something. And you'll certainly learn it today on this Father's Day. Now, this might seem like a stretch away from where I am in Genesis 4, 25, 26. At the top of your paper, I wrote Psalms 118, 24. And this is what this says, and you should really grab it. This is the day. Now, let me ask you a question. What day is he talking about? Today. This is the day. Today. Now, he made seven days. But it's always about today. He made seven days. He made Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He made them all. Made them all. God made them all. You know, people say, well, they, you know, they, they've tagged Monday. Wouldn't you hate to be called Monday? Because it's always a blue Monday. Yeah. Just depends what kind of weekend you had, I guess, what kind of a Monday you're going to have. But this is the day. The day you're living in, the, the morning you got up, and the day you're living until you go back to bed, 
This is the day. Every day is this day. Now watch what he says about it. This is the day which the Lord has made. What day is it? Today. It's always today. It's always today. Every today that you live in from morning to night is the day the Lord has made. The Lord has made it. Not just brought it into existence, but conducts the affairs of it. Not just bring it into existence. Okay, today is Monday. Well, what he's talking about is everything that's inside Monday is today, and everything in today God has planned out. This is the day, today, it's always today, that the Lord has made. Now watch what he says. Watch what he says to you and what he says to me. Watch this now. Let us, let us, see the emphasis was on the Lord, now the emphasis is on us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What's the it? Today. That's the it. Today. Today is always the day the Lord has made. And he has made it for you to do two things. What? Rejoice and be glad in it. He has a responsibility to put the day out there and to run it. He's still in charge. God's still in charge. Man is not in charge. He's still in charge. Our responsibility has to do with rejoicing and be glad in it. Now, let me tell you something about this. What, what's, your, what's your responsibility and mine? Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. Now, let me show you the difference. Rejoice is directing it towards the Lord. And glad is directing towards yourself. Did you hear me? I know you heard me. Rejoice is directed towards the Lord who has given you the day and everything in it for you to be what? Glad in it. Glad. Not bad. Glad. Glad in it. Write this down on your paper. Write this down in your paper somewhere. Up there about up there where I where I'm at. Write down Romans 12, 12 and 15, 13. Write down Romans 12, 12 and 15, 13. Rejoice is directed towards the Lord. If you study the word rejoice in the Bible, it's a wonderful study. You'll find it's connected with the Lord. It's a strong word. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 12, he says, rejoice in hope. It gives you a whole series of things. One of those series of things as you live out your life today that's in Romans 12, one of them is rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. In the Bible, hope, elpis, the word elpis in the Greek language, the Bible idea of rejoice is an attitude one has towards God being in charge as a as a, an authority system over your life. I can rejoice. No matter what the Lord deals out in my hand, I can rejoice. Why? Because this is the day and everything in it that the Lord has made. You understand that? Well, you're really going to have miserable days in your life, and you shouldn't have them. They all should be what? Filled with rejoicing and glad. 
Well, you say to me, how could a person live like that all the time? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you. You say, that's, a, that's an impossibility. Not with the Lord, because, because God has made the day. Every today, God has made, and he's, everything in it, he's, been in, he's in control of it. You're not in control of today. You make today. You can't even make tomorrow. Oh, so you, you need to understand that. In Romans 15, chapter verse 13, Paul talks about God filling you with all hope in believing. My God will fill you with the hope in believing. You see, hope is in God. It's our trust we put in God that God has laid out my day for me. I mean, you don't even question it when you go to work and, the, and the, the, uh, your employer hands you a worksheet for the day. You just salute and go do it. This is what I'm talking about with the Lord in your day. Every today has an order to it, and God puts the order to it. You pay attention to God and how he's ordering your day. Your day should be on your end of it. Your day should be filled with rejoicing and gladness. That's not too hard to do, is it, you suppose? Yes, if you know who's in control of your day. And it's certainly not you. Nor is it anything else in your life. But God Almighty, you need to understand this principle. You need to understand this principle. Last in the life of Adam and Eve, last Father's Day for Adam and Eve now, we've studied this. The last Father Day a year ago in their life was filled with pain, heavy emotional heaviness in their life, their world had been turned upside down. They couldn't hardly breathe the breath that God gave them because of the suffering of their soul. When their oldest son Cain murdered his youngest brother and then was exiled from their life. Exiled for life from their life. We studied that. It's what's talked about in the earlier part of chapter 4. So we're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to talk about how God took their yesterday and turned it into a marvelous today. How he took a terrible experience in the life of these parents, and what a bad Father's Day they went through a year ago. And how God has opened their life. And this year, Father's Day, it's bright. Listen, it shouldn't depend on circumstances, though. It should depend on the Lord. It is the Lord that has made the day. He made last year's Father's Day, and he made this year's Father's Day. Even though the experiences of the couple were different as they had to engage in it. You can always find room for rejoicing and to be glad. You can always find room for it. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice. He doesn't tell you what kind of a day that's going to be. It's just going to be today. Today's got full of a lot of stuff in your life. You must stay focused on God and not on the circumstances of life. Rather, the source of life, not the circumstances of life. So let's pray. The Holy Spirit is a great teacher of the, of the hour of study. John 14, 26, his job is to teach and recall. We're asking him to do that today. 
You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin is confessed through 1 John 1, 9. God, because of his character, always forgives because of the blood of Christ. It's called cleansing. If we confess our sin, the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin. Not for salvation this time, but for sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray today, Father, as we approach this subject, on this Father's Day, we might approach it by the ministry of the Holy Spirit teaching us how this lesson applies to our life in a personal way. I pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me show you, let me show you four doctrines. I put them on your paper. It won't say doctrine. You'll have to write it. Psalms 100, 118, 24, a doctrinal principle is established. This passage brings hope to all spiritually advancing fathers, no matter what the circumstances of life. Since it's Father's Day, I mention fathers. Don't you love the, the, what they call the Lord's Prayer? We try to teach it to all the little children because they'll never forget it as adults. You teach it to little children because they'll never... In the, darkest, in the darkest moment of an adult's life, if they've learned the Lord's Prayer, it, it, it will cause them to have a moment in a bad situation of having a little glimmer of light. Huh? Our Father who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he goes on to talk more about personal matters. I can't tell you how many people I've known as adults that that Bible, that little prayer that their parents prayed with them in the night, in the morning, in the daytimes, carried them through some dark moments in their life when they couldn't remember and they left church and they didn't, wasn't studying the Bible anymore. And, and yet in some of the darkest times in their life, they would remember that prayer and they'd pray that prayer and they'd say it was like, it was a, life, a piece of God in me just came alive. That's in Matthew 6, 9, and 10. It's not on your paper, but it should be. And so there's a doctrinal principle in our opening passage of Psalms 118.24. It says there's hope to all spiritually advancing fathers, no matter what circumstances of life. We live, we always live in today. We don't live in yesterday. It's a mistake. We don't live in tomorrow. That's a mistake. You live in today where God can clean up all the mistakes. You live when God can clean them up before the day's over. Right? Well, you do know about that passage in Ephesians 4 where it says don't go to bed with, with stuff in your heart, right? Get it settled. There's a second, uh, uh, and this is true with Adam's uh, last father's day as we're dealing with it. His last fa father's day, as I mentioned, was filled with sadness, and today it's gladness. It, here's a doctrinal point. Adam and Eve certainly needed to find hope and comfort in the doctrine of this is the day which the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. That, that's a strong doctrinal principle. Here's a doctrinal principle that goes in the same line as Psalms 118, 24. Here's another doctrinal principle. We know that God calls us all things to work together for good, right? But there's a to those. See, we miss that. We love to quote the first half of that and not take responsibility for the second half. If you want the first half of this, you're going to take, re take responsibility for the second half. Now, who doesn't want the first half? I mean, who doesn't want that? We know that God causes all things to work together for good. That's what I'm talking about in every today of your life. Watch this, though. It's to those, and he uses it twice. Circle that. To those. Circle those to, the, to those. It's used twice. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
You say, well, Ron, I love God. Can I get that? Can I get that promise? Yeah, but it's only half, it's only half done, right? It's only half fulfilled. What's the other half? Understanding the calling God has on your life. There's not one person in here that believes that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you salvation by grace through faith and not of yourself is a gift. Not one person in here that believes that, that can't claim that verse today as you sit there in that pew. Not one person. Everybody wants the first half because that's God's responsibility to you. But nobody wants the second half, which is your responsibility to God. But if you want to promise, you got to fulfill the, what he's declared to you. Now, what's he declared? Here's the promise. We know that God causes all things to work together for what? So you don't have bad days. You want to start your day out miserable, call it a bad day. It'll all go downhill because you put the wrong idea in your mind. You don't, listen, Christians don't have bad days. They have what days? You have good days when you let God run them. Look, look, look. I'm not making this stuff up. We know that God causes all things to work. God causes all things to work. Together, he puts all the pieces together that are messed up in your life. He puts them together, right, So, for good. He puts them all together. He, he makes all your mistakes. He cleans them up for you. If you'll let him, he'll clean them up, make them good. Make, oh, you made another mistake. Okay, come to me. Come to me. Come to me, child. Come to me. Okay, let me fix it. He fixes it to good, right? My, 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 my. Do you know how to walk with God? This is just walking with God. You walk with God all the time. You go like, oh, wow, I screwed that up. Okay, let God unscrew it. Listen, to those who love God, to those who love God, and to those who are called according to his purpose. You have a purpose. Listen, if there's no other purpose in your life, and there's much, one would be to let God take care of your everyday life, right? Walk with God. The Old Testament always talked about men who walked with God, women who walked with God. And listen, some of them got books named after them, like Ruth and Esther. Entire books. Here's another doctrinal point from our lesson today. I'm telling you what you're going to get if you pay attention. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake. For whose sake? Yeah, see, we miss, we miss things like that. We put our names where it shouldn't be. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to what? To suffer for his name's sake, right? I mean, listen. Every day should be a good day. Agreed? Who makes it good? Because God is good. So, listen, you'd be smart just to let him clean it up as it goes along the day. Screw up, let him clean it up. You know, aisle four. God, God go, that guy got it. You know when I say aisle four? You know, well, I know. Went to a commercial break right there. Listen, not only to believe in him, but to what? Suffer. Listen, we get into suffering, and then we get all bent out of shape about it. We get all bent out of shape. It has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe, but to what? For whose sake? For whose sake? Make sure everybody gets that right now. For Christ's sake. You're suffering for Christ's sake. Right? That's why you let him keep cleaning up your mistakes. 
so that you can get to the mistakes that are covered under the banner of this was for Christ. You suffered for Christ. Boom, now you're in. You understand that? He cleans up your messes. Unless you, you, you confess them, he takes care of them. The blood of Christ is a powerful idea. The blood of Jesus Christ is a part. What can wash away my sins? Every day, all the way, but it's always the blood of Christ, not yours, not yours. All right, well, that was Philippians 1, 29, 30. Let, let, me, let me deal with a, a few points today. A year later on Father's Day in the life of Adam and Eve, there was a new life and a great celebration in their home and in their heart when God gave them another child. I don't know where you think they come from. <laughs> That's why they're worthy to be kept. Children come from God. They come from God. And you're a custodian over them, and you need to be aware of it. He probably takes your children more serious than you do. A year later, there was celebration and new life in the house of Adam and Eve as they were, as they brought into their, their home and their life and their heart a third child, Seth, the appointed one. The Messianic lineage of Genesis 3.15, where the seed would come through the woman, had been restored when Cain murdered Abel, the seed line was gone. The messianic seed line was gone. Satan had successfully attacked the messianic lineage of Jesus Christ. So God gave them, God gave them Seth. The lineage was restored, and with it, their hope. The hope in the Bible is an interesting concept because it means confident expectation. When God tells you you can put your hope in it, it's because he stands behind it. When God gives you a promise, he stands behind it. You can have confident expectation or hope that what he's promised, write this down, Romans 4.21, what God has promised, he is able to perform. What God has promised, he's able to do. Romans 4.21. And so their hope has come back to confident expectation in the eternal plan of God, listen, under their watch. Probably no sadder group couple you would have ever met in the ancient world would have been Adam and Eve when one son was buried and the other exiled and the Messianic homes looked dismal. And except for God, they would have been dismal. How important is God in your life? When you get to the end of the end, it should be a new beginning. When you get to the end of the end, it should be a new beginning. Where did you learn that, Ron? I learned it from Adam and Eve. Are they at the end of the end? One son is murdered, the other is exiled, never to return. The end is the end. And here's a new beginning. Who brings new beginnings in your life? And you, you ought to want them every day. Today is the time of new beginnings. New beginning in your marriage, a new beginning in your personal life, a new beginning in your business, in your, in your family. New beginnings. The end is not the end. The end of the end is the new beginning in God. That's where your hope is. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. And that's the, and that's the truth. Ah, what a wonderful song. And that's the truth. And so there's hope again in the life of Adam and Eve on this Father's Day of a new beginning. A child has been born named Seth, an appointed one by God, to restore the messianic lineage of Christ. What a day in the life of this couple. Not only that, but in the very next verse, 26, and the end of the chapter, they be, not only did they become parents, in the same breath that they became parents, they became grandparents. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And we often talk about being able to skip over the parents and go right to the grandkids. No, I don't know. We do. All my kids are glad for that, I guess. Look, do you know what I think really depressed, probably if there was any depression in their life after the funeral and the exiling, and it looked like they were at the dead, dead end, is that it, it, it fell on their watch. You know, I spend more time about that than probably anything in my life in ministry. Not being able to fulfill the plan of God in the destiny that's been set before my life each day. I think probably that bothered them more than anything. On their watch. Listen, is there any more watch coming? Apart from God, there's not, is there? And this couple, they weren't. Look, we tried twice and look what's happened. We're not gonna do a third, and all of a sudden a third comes and there's a child, and now we're back in the we're back in the game. Why? Because of God. Listen to this. Romans 15, 13, I'm gonna quote it once again for you. It's on your paper. Now may the God of hope. The God of what? That's where you get it from. You're not going to get it from, you're not getting it from Cheerios or, what was that where you used to get things? Uh, Superman kind of, uh, Wheaties. Yeah, bref, bref, breakfast, a champion. He's not going to get it from there. You get a lot of things from it, but not that. May the God of hope fill you, fill, the God of hope fill you, fill you, fill you to the fullest. Fill you with all joy and peace. How? How is God going to fill? How is the God of hope going to fill you with all joy and peace? Now watch this. What, what, what's it say? I wrote it on your paper. What's the Bible say? In believing. Circle that. In believing. You're not going to get it because you sat in church. It's because the Bible sets in you. The God of hope will fill you with joy and peace. How? In believing. So that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, what you're learning today is a very important thing that you must learn in your life. Especially when you come to the end of the end. We, call, we used to call it the dead end. It's a place of new beginnings. Some guy, times God has to bring you to a place of dead end in your own life. Because you're, you're so hell bent on making bad choices. He just lets you make them until you're just nearly drowned. And then he goes like, where, where are they going to put you next? They're going to throw me out in the dump. The garbage truck is going to come along. They're going to put me in a bag and throw me out, and I'm going to be it. And God says, mm-mm, my, my, my. I'll make you a new man in Christ. I will make you a new man in Christ. 
It, he's not going to make you just a new man. He's going to make you a new man in Christ. And he'll sure do it. He'll sure do it. He's true to his promises, dear hearts. He is true to his promises. The second thing is they named their child Seth. Seth meaning God has appointed another offspring in the place of Abel and Cain. Abel and Cain. This means that the Messianic lineage has been restored. Listen to me. Their new beginning became a new beginning for the Messianic lineage. Listen, your new beginnings are going to light off new beginnings. Do you understand that? Did they get a new beginning? They hit a dead end. No more kids, right? They hit a dead end. God says, God opened the womb, put the guile in there. It was a new beginning. And look at God lit a fire off a new beginning with Seth that is going to go all the way to Noah in an entire civilization called the Antediluvian civilization. Noah's flood is going to wipe out the whole world. But listen, before it goes, God has lit new beginnings. He's lit 10 new beginnings from Seth. He lit, not only was Seth a new beginning, but when you look at the genealogy, look at, and then Enosh, was, was Enosh a new beginning? And it goes all the way to Noah. I'm going to tell you, when God lights new beginnings in your life, you have no idea where that new beginning light is going to be passed on to, but it's going to be passed on. Do you not know that? Listen to me. Listen to me. It's part of your calling. It's part of your calling. You need to get this. Seth. Now, here's what's interesting. When Seth was born, Adam was 130. I know, girls, don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. We had two children. My wife said, I think that's probably, probably be it. I said, no, 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 I ain't got my boy yet. I got to have a boy, Jan. I got to have a boy. She said, well, you better, you're talking to the wrong person. You better be talking to God then. I know, but wait, let me give it one more shot. Hundred hundred and thirty been a pretty impossibility, wasn't it? Except they lived to be nine hundred. Okay, it, it's all about perspective, isn't it? That, that's like a teenager having it at one hundred and thirty, <laughs> having it at one hundred and thirty. Well, I just um, listen to this. On Tuesdays, I've been doing a study on the tribulation. Uh, I wouldn't suggest coming at this point at it because I'm about to conclude it. Um, but for those who are in my Tuesday study, write this down. Like I'm going to draw, so, I'm going to draw something to, for you. Write this down. Revelation 12, 1 through 17. When you study the book, uh, when you study the tribulation, there are interludes that people don't pay any attention to, and it gets your head all messed up in studying the second coming of Christ. Interludes. Matthew, the, I mean, Revelation 12, 1 through 17, was an interlude of the, his, of the history that went back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and Seth. And here's how it went. Here's how it went. The Bible says that Satan, this was part of his program, stood before the woman of Genesis 3.15, who was about to give birth to the Messianic seed. And the reason that he stood there was to devour the child when it came out. It was a picture of the history that began with Genesis 3.15, Cain and Abel, and goes all the way to the second coming of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Is that not amazing? You should read that. You should read that. 
Well, uh, if, you're, if you're in my Tuesday studies, you have read that. Let me go to point three. Now, we have, we have a listing in Luke, the third chapter, 36 through, well, just 38. The last verse in Luke 3, the last very verse, verse 38, it gives us the foundation, the first four genealogy people of Christ. It's interesting how God wrote it in Luke, the third chapter, verse 38. He listed God first, reading, or reading from Hebrew, from the right to the left. You're at the last verse, 38. So you start with God. It's kind of sensible that you would. And then you read all the way up to 23 to Jesus. You, well, I'm just telling you the way they wrote it. Okay? Listen, it says God. It starts with God. Then goes to Seth. It, go, it starts with God, goes to Adam, and then goes to Seth, and then goes to Enosh. See that? Well, if you looked at Luke, the third chapter 38, you would find that. This same recording or mess, of Messianic lineage is recorded in Genesis 5 and Luke, the third chapter. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting. In the Hebrew, the word Enosh the child of Seth means frail and weak to save himself. He's in the messianic lineage but he can't save himself because he's under Adam's sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 all human beings are born in Adam and they're born spiritually dead. In Christ, you're made spiritually alive. And so there, these people now in the lineage of Christ are considered in need of salvation. Their, their salvation didn't come because they went to church, because they owned a Bible or they read a Bible or they thought about these things. Listen, all that are in the Messianic lineage are in need of salvation. They're all, man, mankind is now identified as Enosh. In our passage in Romans, the fourth chapter, in verse 26, it says at the very end of verse 26, it was Enosh, it was then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. What do they mean by that? They mean to be saved. They, all mankind needs to be saved. How is he saved? Identify himself as a sinner born in Adam. Romans 5.12, Wherefore by one man Adam, sin entered the world and death by sin. And so the sin death passed upon all mankind. How does it get removed? Jesus came, died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead third day. It's called the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. What must I do to be saved? You must believe it. Romans 1, 16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is how this thing works. It doesn't work any other way. You need to understand that. It doesn't, you're not going to get saved. It doesn't, you've been born frail, weak, in need of salvation. The first person that ought to identify that is you. You go like, yeah, I know I'm weak and frail, and I know I made some bad decisions. Now what? Now get saved. Now you get saved. What will that do? Listen, it will give you a new creation life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. New beginnings. You want a new beginning? Get born again. You got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, and he will remove them as far as the east is from the west. That he was buried, and he was raised from the dead to give eternal life. Eternal life is what Christ gives you. It's not what you give yourself. 
This is what he gives you. And so how important is this? How important is this? All right? And my final point, missionary evangelism. Missionary evangelism. By the prophetic gospel of Christ, that's Old Testament salvation, would be the message throughout the next 10 generation of believers in the antediluvian world because of the new beginning that was established with Seth and went to Enosh and went all the way to Noah before the flood came and wiped out that whole civilization. Missionary evangelism. I mean, how important is that? I mean, and does that work for just us going across the oceans or the seas? No. How about across the street? How about to the next door? We've been called to be missionary evangelists. We're all missionary evangelists. My man Willie will tell you it's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And those of us that take heart in all of that know that's true. We all know that's true. It was then, the Bible says, that men began. I wrote this in the Hebrew for you because something's there that you can't see in the English. I wrote it down. The word began and then to call. Those are two different verbal structures. We call that a paraphrastic phrase. We do in English and we do in Greek and Hebrew. It's a paraphrastic. It takes these two things to get one thing done. You don't have it completed until you have both these parts put together in one whole. When men began, watch this word began. I wrote it to you. It's in the Hebrew, it's hafel. There's hifel, hafel, and hifpael. I know. I'm just telling you, I know it. A hafel is causative. There has to be a cause for him to call out to be saved. You know what it is? His recognition that he is a sinner and he hasn't been saved by grace. He's a sinner. We're all sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which we're all. We're all sinners. We're born sinners. Being moral doesn't correct it. Being saved is what corrects it. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. You've got to believe that. You've got to believe that. If you think life is tough, you haven't had, if you combined all your worst days into one, it would be nothing like to die without Christ. I'm telling you the truth. You need to listen to me. Not only is, is Hafel, but Hafel causative, what's the cause? Well, man, man is in need of being saved. And so what does he do? He calls upon the Lord. He calls upon the name of the Lord. Write this down, and then I'm going to close. Romans, the 10th chapter. I wrote down, at least read 8 through 15, because that's how this applies to you and I in the church age. It applies the same way, except by a historical gospel. Christ came. He died on a hill that we know and can visit. He was buried. We know the tomb. He was raised. We know the story. A historical gospel. Here's what's interesting to me. Hebrews 11, 1 through 7, read sometime during this week. When you read it, you will find three believers out of the Antediluvian period are recorded. These three people, 
are declared have obtained the witness. They have obtained the witness of faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is about. The three people are interesting. The three people listed, the first is Abel, the second is Enosh, and the third is Noah. These are three people out of the antediluvian world. Abel is not mentioned in the genealogy. The other two are. Do you find that not interesting? He didn't get into the messianic lineage, but he got into the, to the hall of faith book, Hebrews 11. I find that. Listen, here's what I find. I find an enormous statement about the grace of God. What that teaches me is the, the enormity of the grace of God. Yet here he is, he's listed first in the hall of faith of all the history. First guy mentioned. Happy Father's Day. This is the day the Lord has made. Therefore, you should what? You can't do it apart from Christ. That ain't going to happen. It should happen in Christ, though, because he's got it all. You can be confident. You can have hope that he's got, he's got it. So, Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way to study with us on Father's Day. Oh, Father, such a tragic story. Last Father's Day in the house of Adam and Eve. A whole different look this year on this Father's Day. Celebration, cake, and just celebration because of new beginnings that come with God. When we come to the end of ourself, that's a good place to be because there's a new beginning. And new beginnings light new beginnings in other people's life. Because we've obtained a witness like Abel, like Seth, like Noah. For we in our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.